You identify as the persecuted father. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are Irenacast. I'm Jeff. I'm Bonnie. This is Rajiv. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This week, Sir Alan and Pastor Casey are on assignment, and you are listening to the vocal stylings of... <laughs> <laughs> Myself, Rajiv, and Body, and uh, we are going to be talking about parenting, just straight up parenting. We thought about you know parenting in quarantine and all that kind of stuff, but we just think parenting itself. Um, and this may turn into just a counseling session for myself, seeking the the wisdom of Rajiv and Bonnie in their uh, years of, of raising children and having them adults now, and me just trying to figure out what the heck's going on. But we'll see how it goes. And then for our segment, we're going to be doing uh, one of our old segments called Top 3. And we're going to be looking at Top 3 TV families. Uh, so that'll be that'll be a lot of fun. So let's let's start with, to me, the, the, uh, the obvious question. What is parenting? Why? What is the purpose of parenting? I grew up not having that modeled for me. But then as I grew up and, you know, you hear parenting. And then when I worked in youth ministry... I was obviously involved with parents and was told I wouldn't understand because I'm not a parent when I tried to give advice. But then when things fell to shit, <laughs> they came to me. We need your help. Oh, that's interesting. I thought that I was anyway. That's just obviously some stuff coming out there. But uh, what like what is parenting? Because I've always seen parenting and many of the people in my life, the parenting kind of boils down to two categories. It's protection and provision. Like that's kind of the whole purpose. So, so Rajiv Bani, tell me what is, what is parenting? Why, why do we do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and many people experience the yearning to be a parent, you know, there's, there's something in us that um, calls us into this like very complicated calling. Yeah. What is parenting? She's that's such a huge question. Yeah, I think like, you know, protection and provision, that's just the basic stuff. It's like, that's what you do to keep CPS from getting called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, I mean, parenting is really so much more, you know, there's the nurturing, time, connection, listening, lots and lots of listening. And some, some of the stuff I'm sharing it comes from a lot of mistakes. It's like, it's not like I knew all this stuff along the way. It's like, I've learned as, as the, our sons have gotten older and they're in their middle and late twenties. Now feedback about mistakes we made. It's like, okay, if I had to do it over again, these are things. So I'm looking forward to being a grandparent kind of getting it right there. <laughs> but that's all. That's a whole nother, uh, that's a whole nother <laughs> episode. Whole I, I will draw our listeners attention to the fact that we have discussed this particular issue before, but it was very specific to Rajiv and Bonnie's journey through parenting during deconstruction and how that affected their family. And I will put the, the, the link to that episode in these show notes, because that was a great episode where they sat down with their, their, their adult children and really discussed kind of that time in their life. And it's just fantastic. I guess you can consider this a, an, an appendix to that. Is that what it is? What's the appendum? What's the word? Mm -hmm. It's okay. Yeah. So we're, sorry. we're continuing that conversation. It's a, <laughs> sort of. A do, do hickey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've come to think of parenting. Um, and I think that, that adults in society are all parents. You know, it takes a village to raise a child, and that's really true. Sets of parents who are the ones responsible for living in the home with the child, they are the primary parents, but every single person is involved in bringing up young people in society. And I've, I've come to think of it as like, it's accompaniment. Having the privilege, the honor of walking alongside an individual that you don't own, even though they may have your last name, there's, you know, this, this is a, a person who's developing and growing and is, a, is preparing to launch into the world as their own person. 
in relationship with all the other people out there. Parenting is accompanying that person in the process of doing that. Right. And trying to keep your own will and wishes yeah. from getting in the way of who they are. And that's, God, God, that's so, that's such a challenge, you know? Right. It seems counterproductive to have to start by holding tight and then slowly loosening a grip because we kind of, when we are able to, to grab something that we love and like, our instinct is to just hold tighter and tighter and tighter. And I know that that was my experience. I'm going to probably refer back to my experience as a youth minister a lot during this, but that was my experience seeing a lot of parents is that they, especially when, you know, their students hit adolescence and they start asserting their independence and all that kind of stuff, that there's this tendency to, to grasp tighter. And that obviously caused a lot of issues. And, you know, it's, it's this, this person that's part you and all not you <laughs> and, and working through that whole thing. Um, it's, you know, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It, it's definitely one of those things that you don't get till you've been there. Right. You know, and, and, and I would say that counts for each stage of parenting as, as things evolve, like Jeff, you know, what you were talking about and letting, let some emotion come through with parents telling you, well, you don't really know what it's like. And yes, that's, that's true. But then they come to you because what they're realizing is their kids are bigger than their purview. Their kids are more. And, and you know a part, you know their kids in different ways and different things about their kids that they don't have a clue about. So they're like, what's going on here? You know, and, and then it starts to break open. I'm not the only one who's involved in, like what Bonnie was describing, in parenting my children. Now they've grown beyond the needs of what I can offer as a parent and what the household can offer. And they need youth ministers, teachers, coaches pastors. I think, yeah, I think all along the way, um, holding our children loosely is really important. I think that parenting involves a lot of grief and, you know, like anything worthwhile, it's just the way that it is. You get to a point where you feel like, oh, you know, we have this synergy, things are going great. And then they develop to, to become, they are evolving to become new people right before your eyes. And so you, in a sense, have to grieve, and so do they, that what has just passed, and now there's not, something new on the horizon for them and for your, you and your relationship with them. And you're doing that constantly, constantly. And it's so beautiful because it's like this unfolding that happens, but, but it's also there's loss involved. And parents and that transition between childhood and adolescence, which is really messy and awkward and difficult for everybody. And it brings up all of your experiences in adolescence because you're, you're seeing it played out once again. So if you haven't done your work to heal those things or to parent yourself when you didn't maybe have a parent during that time of your life, then it all comes rushing back to you once again. And that can be, so parents are dealing with that as well as the grieving process of their child is leaving childhood and now entering a whole new phase of their lives. I, I wondered when you say that, I re remembered, and this was only two years ago at this point, but uh, that idea of like stuff rushing back from your childhood, was it weird for the two of you the first time, like they went to school and you were back on an elementary school campus? Like, I felt like I was having this surreal out of body experience was like weird like everyone's and everything is so little <laughs> and i remember it being this big it was i it took me like i didn't hear anything that happened at that opening orientation because i was just like in this like weird euphoria of did i just go back in time i don't know if everyone else has experienced that but it was it was super weird for me well we were teachers Oh, so we okay. So you were you were in that world. You were in, in that world on school campuses. So it wasn't, yeah, we didn't we didn't really leave school till we were in our thirties. But in other things, you know, like sports teams and stuff like that, it it had it was a similar experience. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think one of the the challenges of that sort of childhood to adolescence bridge is you know the 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 child is starting to declare 
you know, and claim their own territory. And sometimes it's done in really hostile and vulgar ways. Sometimes it's done very passively and sneakily. One of the challenges for the parent is there's a recognition. It's like, I'm still trying to carve out my own sense of self and identity, and I haven't been able to do it yet. And that's where I think that's the underlying factor to like, well, you know, what, what makes you think you're so special? It's it's because the parents are still, you know, they're still contending with, I'm not the person I'm trying to be. And I haven't gotten the breaks that my my kid is expecting to get now. And and as a parent, you have to shed a lot of that stuff because that's not their fault. You know, that that's just work you have to do. Have you ever had this overwhelming sense of I have no idea what I'm doing? Every day, yeah. <laughs> every day, because yeah. that is a big thing for me is I feel like, you know, obviously we all, this is probably just the nature of our world in general with social media, but we present a very particular way of how our family is going. And we all know that that's, it's not exactly like that. We all know it, but it doesn't st- help stop us from comparing. And I'm wondering like how much of an influence like our own parenting influences our actual parenting, like how we were raised and whether I'm sure there are some people who are trying to duplicate, right? Because they were kids and they didn't realize certain stuff because, you know, parent doesn't want to reveal everything stuff's happening. And they're like, well, they don't need to know about this right now. And that we're having financial difficulties and we barely made it through. But from the kid's perspective, hey, everything was was great throughout all that. So I know. So I, I, I would assume with good parenting, we want to try to emulate that. And maybe we don't feel we we live up. And then for me, it was more of like a lack of parenting and nurturing. And like I have I feel like I have no framework whatsoever on how to like what a family dynamic is supposed to look like and how do I be nurturing? Because a lot of the things that happened to me, it was like, well, you figure it out. So my tendency as a parent with my kids is figure it out. You got it. You don't need my help. And then my wife's the opposite. She's like, well, let me No, They need help. And I'm, so there's this kind of like balance of like trying to, I guess we always going to, is certain to a certain extent emulate how we were raised. But uh, it, I'm wondering like the more, the more conscious, like, oh man, I remember this and I want to duplicate that. Or I remember this and I want to go the opposite direction and how much that plays into that. So like for you two, like, was there a, like a, like a, each of you trying to duplicate your only families. And then there was kind of, I'm sure there was clashes in how that worked out with what, what you all were doing. And then just the, all the other dynamics that you guys were working with, uh, with deconstruction and race and <laughs> everything else. Um, did you did you find that you know compulsion to duplicate what you were raised with? I, I think um, developmental theorists talk about that a lot, actually, in response to parenting. Exactly what you said, Jeff, which is like that you're either emulating your parents or you're reacting. It's reactive parenting or like you know copying your parents, emulating your parents, and and I think we often parent ourselves. Like we see ourselves in our kids and we think about, man, when I was five, this is the way that I needed to be parented. And we project that parenting onto our kids and they're not us. Like they're completely different people. So it's, it's uh, hard sometimes to remember that. And really we have to follow them. I think They'll, they'll help us know how they need to be parented but our own stuff sometimes really does get in the way of that because we bring in all this baggage from the way we were parented and sometimes we respond to it by reacting sometimes we we copy it yeah it's you know there's there are times it's less and less now but there there were big swaths of time where I was like oh my god it's just my dad's flying out of my mouth <laughs> and I'm like yeah, I I really didn't want to be like that um and and you know then there's other things where it's like you know, the the practice of taking a breath. You know, we we talk about this in peer to peer relationships all the time, but just taking a breath and thinking something through for a few mi- moments before responding is seems like it's particularly hard in parenting. But the times when I've done that in parenting roles, the outcome has been exponentially better than what I was going to say as a reflex and you know over time it gets better again partly because your kids get better at calling you out at it if you're open to that which i'm I'm grateful we've worked into that 
So what then what now? Like, I mean, uh, for you two on the other end, how has that relation like what does parenting look like when they have become? I mean, we're not none of us are fully have become, but, you know, when they're adults and they're in that threshold of life. I mean, how what are some of the, the more surprising changes to the dynamics that you have with them in your relationship? And maybe what were some of the more challenging ones? Um, that's, I think even before going to that question, I it's important to say that you you can mess this up so many different ways and it's still going to be okay. Like it's still going to be okay. Just loving your kids, honoring their journeys, being alongside and just, just being an admiration of these people who are, you know, you're gifted with is really, I think, what parenting is all about. And as long as that's okay, as long as that's in place, the millions of mistakes that you're going to make, it's going to be okay. That's um, the hardest thing to um, remember. I mean, I can't <laughs> really tell is. you how many times after I've done something stupid, I'm thinking, oh man, I just ruined them for the rest of their life. They're going to like, I have that thought so right. many times. Like, what am I doing? Like how, what, what kind of foundation am I like? Every decision has the weight of the world on it. And I'm just like, oh man, mm. I yelled at them for spilling their cereal. Damn it. <laughs> you know, like they're going to have, you know, PTSD every time they pour cereal bowl, like I've just <laughs> blown everything up in my mind. So yeah, no, that's important to hear and remind ourselves of for sure. Yeah. Well, and and I think there's a lot of power to an apology too, from a parent to a child, and but to, like to actually mean it to work on changing the behavior that prompted the apology in the first place. You know, that's cert I have a lot of experience with that, and I'm glad. I don't know where I picked it up, but I was never. It was never modeled where parents apologize to their kids and try to change that. I, that was like a completely different universe. But somewhere along the line, I picked that up, and I, I wish I could remember who or what to credit, but can't. Maybe you can just give yourself the credit, Rajiv. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'll give myself credit for having practiced it. <laughs> yeah, I think at this stage of parenting, if you're if you're fortunate enough to really continue to have this relationship with your kids, if you make it through that adolescent period, which is prolonged. And I think mm -hmm. it's getting longer and longer as as uh, the generations continue on. We, we should talk about adolescence for a minute. Okay. Don't you think? I, well, I was going to I was going to respond to Jeff's question, but if you want to talk about adolescence, that's fine too. Well, as like what you just talked about, adolescence is longer now than yeah. we've ever had before. I mean, part of it's our survival, but part of it's just even financial. It's like what does a young person actually need to launch today? like a $600,000 salary to be able to buy a house and put down. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's ludicrous what the, the world that has come into being and a, a young college graduate and facing, and then you add on top of that, this global pandemic, I'm just like, Oh man, poor kids. And I mean, I say kids, but I mean, you know, young adults, it's just unfair, but it, in that adolescent period, yes, it's extended it's more complicated because of social media. And I, I'm, I'm not bashing social media. I'm just saying it's more complicated because of it. And we, we aren't digital natives. Our generation doesn't know it from the inside. You well, know, our generation, but younger, gener younger parents do. Yeah. Jeff's kind of up there with us too. Not quite, but <laughs> I'm, I'm right in the middle. I remember <laughs> the before times and <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Yeah, well, but I mean, the social media just exacerbates what is like. It's not anything new necessarily. I don't think it just sort of makes it a more. I mean, it's new in that uh, there may be a generational gap, but I mean, that's always existed. Right, and, but the, yeah, it, it's not a judgment. I, I want to be clear. I'm not making a judgment call on this, but like friend connections. You know, we used to hang out together. We used to meet up at the convenience store, at, at the gym parking, I mean, the school parking lot. We used to hang out together in person and we had to muddle through stuff. Now there's this online contact, which has created a sense of connection without the physical proximity. And I, I think that's creating a dynamic of socialization that that is very different. Yeah, I think... 
I think for me, and this is just my take on it, is just for adolescence itself. I think what social media does in particular is heighten the stuff that's already there. The questions of who am I? What do people think of me? And now all those things that I think we internalized and probably almost, well, not, I don't want to say didn't, but a lot of times the stuff that we internalized necessarily wasn't said to us. Uh, now you're, you're, you put yourself out on a platform and all those things are going to be confirmed depending upon how much you're in that space. And I think that that's that hard part is that, that, that struggle of adolescence to figure out who you are. And we don't even have a framework. We don't even have a consistent framework for what adolescence is. It's essentially like 100 years old uh, because it's it's more socially and economic driven and everything like that. And what adolescent looked like for us, which which you could argue we were only the second generation of quote unquote like adolescence. Yes. Mm-hmm. And each generation has been so different. I mean there's some things that are similar, but because it is – based and cultural change, it is going to be different with each generation. Uh, and I think that – I think what we're, we're talking about in terms of the parenting part is really that core of understanding that this person is an individual. They're they're related to me. I was a part of bringing them into this world, but they're still an individual and listening is an important thing and knowing who they are and like enjoying them, <laughs> like letting them have those moments of – uh, I, I just remember like everything, everything I loved was dismissed. And even working with students, parents, they were so quick to dismiss the things that they loved because they wanted like, quote unquote, the real stuff. But that was the real stuff for them. And it was a part of their expression of who their identity is. So I think adolescence is a, is a, is a tough one because it's it embodies selfishness, which is something that we automatically kind of revolt against. But we don't realize that this is an important this is an important selfishness. This is a necessary selfishness. And then how do we, how do we just encourage that to not be destructive for other people around them? And I think that that maybe is the trick. I don't know. Yeah. Encouraging um, self-centeredness is important in adolescence. And when they're pushing back against everything you've taught them, that is their job at that stage of life. And it is so painful. It's important not to underestimate the pain <laughs> in adolescence for parents but it's, it can be a joyful kind of pain. And I don't mean that in a like sadistic way, but you know your kid is growing up. You know that they're going through, like you have prepared them to get to this this stage, this this next phase of life. And when you see them pushing back against everything you hold dear, that's part of their process. I think what's far more dangerous is when they don't grow up beyond adolescence. And I mean, I mean, there, I think there are a lot mm-hmm. of adults out there that haven't left that sense of self-centeredness yep. and still operate in the world that way because our culture sort of rewards that type of way of operating. So parents, you know, and all of us who are adults in the room, our, part of our job is to help them to go through adolescence and be as self-centered as they need to be so then they can begin once again from a central core, from a moral compass, then offer themselves to the world in selfless kinds of ways, you know, um, in self-giving kinds of ways. Mm-hmm. And we we kind of developed uh, some language that we used internally as a family during those times. We called it, he's in, we, we would say he's in the woods right now, but that's where he belongs. It's sort of like just trouncing around, smashing stuff, screaming at the top of his lungs. He's in the woods right now. And we would say that to them. It's like, it sounds like you're in the woods right now, which is where you need to be. So I'm going to, I'm going to listen to you that way, or I'm going to, you know, interact with you that way. And it got to the point where they would actually show up with their frustrations sometimes and would say, look, I know I'm in the woods right now, but I just, I need to be heard. I'm like, okay. So that, it ended up becoming a fun, but important little phrase that could help frame what was going on from time to time. Yeah, I, I loved, I love adolescence. You know, I, I probably like it more as a youth pastor than as a parent, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I love that period of time in the life of a human because mm-hmm. it's so incredibly rich. And one day to the next is brand new. You know, it's just that the stability piece that we sort of get into when we become adults and have all these responsibilities that we have to tend to. 
that hasn't happened yet. So, so much exploration and discovery and just a huge time of spiritual growth, whether people are tending to it or not. Um, kids are, are finding out who they are in, mm-hmm. in the center of their, their beings. So it, it is fun. I taught middle school for a while and coached middle school for, for a number of years, coached uh, basketball. And yeah, th- those ages, a- as, as a non-parent adult figure in their lives, it is a pretty cool space to be in, partly because they, they now understand sarcasm and can absorb and give sarcasm. So you can say shit to kids and they're just like, they think it's cool. Because I'm like, get away from me. You're bothering me right now. They're like, no, you love me. And, you know, in that moment, I really don't. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's just it's just this time of rawness that allows for some really authentic connection. Um, and some of the students that I had at those times, you know, having left education for a number of years and with the development of social media, it's like we've maintained a, a really cool connection a, as adults now, and and you know I would consider us peers. They they still say Mister sometimes, but because those authentic, I mean it's that that kind of raw process in life, the the people that were part of it for you and with you, I, I think they hold a special place, you know. And as parents, some of the most important people to to us are the other adults in our kids lives who recognize something special in them you know it's like we we practically build altars to them for for recognizing that our kids were pretty cool and looking out for them along the way so you know again that parenting umbrella is big what did you learn jeff from being a youth pastor about parenting kids so much you know uh enjoying them like I felt like a lot of parents, they just it was a job to them. It was yes. so like joyless, and it was and and the the moments of joy were based so much on achievement. Yes, and I just I just cringed at that. But like my, you know, despite the my spirituality and theology during my time as a youth pastor, it's still the best years of my life. Like, uh my wife and I in particular, we were, we were partners through that whole thing. And we just had these great relationships with these students and they were wonderful. And we like everything about them. We were just in awe of like they, they, there's so much there and uh, it almost thrusted us into the up and downs of adolescence because we would, we would feel so happy for when they were. And then we would kind of like jump into that, like heartbreak when they were heartbroken it was such a great and – and I know that that comes from – I recently reconnected with my uh, group of friends from youth group when I was in youth group. And we were – we're kind of outcasts in our youth group. We didn't really fit in to like who usually like the youth pastor would gravitate towards and all that kind of stuff. We've met like three times now over Zoom and we've all been chatting and just like reflecting on that time. And it's been it's been really powerful and cathartic to be like, wow, you know, like because of my experience as a youth pastor and then realizing through these conversations that my all my youth groups were like we were like I was I mean, I've said this so many times before, but I was told I attract the wrong kind of kid, you know, but that was all of our youth groups was my outcast group in in youth ministry. And when we were students, we were treated poorly in a lot of ways. And but we were good kids like we we didn't we didn't do anything. We like genuinely cared about people. We were stupid. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, but it was, it was fun. And I really, um, I'm just in awe of adolescence and how difficult it is and how much strength it takes to discover who you are in a world that is trying to tell you all the time who you are in so many different ways. And I think that getting through that with the right guidance and the right people it's a struggle and it's rewarding and it's heartbreaking and it's, it's all of those things. And, you know, when we talk about it takes a village, I know this is anecdotal, but when I look at students that I had in my youth ministry that came from really difficult families, the difference always came down to how many other people they had in their life outside of just their family and how they would open up and become and be able to maneuver through the world. Didn't make it any less hard for them. Didn't make it any less of a struggle. 
because I had such fond fondness for that area, then I've also struggled with a lot of guilt from that time because I wasn't LGBTQ affirming. Uh, I wasn't, you know, not to use a horrible, outdated, stupid phrase at this point, but I wasn't woke like I am now in, in terms of like how all those things played into or highly amplified all those things that I've just mentioned about struggling through adolescence and stuff like that. Um, I've been heartened to see that a lot of those students that are, would consider themselves part of the LGBTQ community now didn't feel that as much as I did, that they still felt part of it. So yeah, I mean, that's a long answer to your question, buddy, but that's, that's exactly what I learned. Like just to celebrate people and let people be themselves. Yeah. What, one of the things about getting to work with young people before you're a parent, whether it's in a school, a church, whatever setting, is you learn good parenting and not good parenting through through observation. And you're like, ooh. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Well, and for us too, we were we wanted to be parents for years, but we were struggling with infertility behind the scenes. And that was you know, that that's when those comments of, well, you're not a parent, you don't understand really stung. And, you know, you guys know me, I'm not going to let someone know that they hurt me or <laughs> anything like that. Uh, but I mean, those were, those were, were difficult moments and they just got even more, you know, amplified as uh, things went on before we, we finally ended that relationship <laughs> uh, with, with evangelicalism. But um you know, I, I'm curious, like we, part of the thing that pe a lot of people talk about when it comes to parenting is that, that the birth moment, right? Like here's this, you're having this divine moment and uh, it changes you forever. And I, I agree that kids change you forever, but I don't think it's certainly as romantic as we, <laughs> we tend to communicate it. And, you know, we can say like, you don't understand until you're there. And that's hundred percent true. But I also think we need to acknowledge that there's a lot of things in life that are like that. Like, like, which is why it's so important for us to hear people's stories. I think that that is true when it comes to, uh, being, uh, obviously I have to, and I'm saying this with no experience whatsoever, but being a person of color or being part of the LGBTQ community, you're not going to know until you're there. Mm -hmm. And there's certain right. things that we're never going to know. Right. Um, and for some people, Parenting is not attainable. And I remember living in that for a long time. So I guess kind of transitioning, and I know, Bonnie, we talked a little bit about this off off, uh, off air, off recording, <laughs> uh, but like how, how is as, – as a parent – so now shifting focus to like us as parents, how has it changed us? And I guess more specifically, like has it informed our spirituality or theology at all? And also, I just shout out to people who choose not to be yes. parents, like they're intentional around um, they want to be really good aunties and uncles and, you know, or uh, adults in kids' lives or young people's lives, but not necessarily be parents. We need you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, spirituality, it's I think something happens when you wake up. And this can be long after birth. <laughs> this can be whenever it happens for you. When you wake up and you look into the eyes of a child, your child, if they have, if it happens to be your child, and you realize that uh, there's a there's a soul that's come into the world that you are in a very deep and special relationship with. There's a connection to the divine, I think, in that experience, at least there was for me, that was very powerful and humbling, like supremely humbling. I'm not sure if, if my parenting strategies have been great for my kids, but being a parent has done a lot for me in terms of my character development and my ability to, to finish that process of growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, when... And and this is taking something from Bonnie. She says, you know, when children are born, parents are also born. And so there's there's like a multiple birth experience that's happening. I, I, I think children are all children are born spiritual. 
you know, their curiosity about the world around them, the, the grasping to learn and understand, uh, you know, and we, we know through some painful mistakes as a human race, how failure to thrive in infancy is where people haven't been held. Babies haven't been held or nurtured or sung to, or, um, so that, that interdependence is deeply, is a deeply spiritual dynamic. And, you know, I, some of my favorite memories of all time revolve around both each, each of the boys, our older son, Julian, from early, early on, he had the ability to pay close and detailed attention to things. I mean, it was just beautiful to watch him look at a flower, like he would examine it and really take it in. And Nick had this ability to sort of sweep through a place and just his arms kind of swinging around and just taking in all the beauty that was around and, you know, sort of adding to it with his sort of free, free spirited energy. Um, so two really different approaches, but both so engaged with the world around them and affected by it and, and recognizing it. And, and I think those, those qualities are really the core of, of what spirituality is. Is just paying attention, experiencing, and and offering. How about for you, Jeff? How has parenting impacted your sense of spirit? Um, I think in terms of spirituality and theology, it has caused me to abandon all parental metaphors for God because I think that they're stupid. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I get them and I understood them for a long time, even though like I never, I, I had no framework for the father son relationship, but now being a parent and thinking about like parenting in relation to God, I think it, it really, it's a really bad metaphor and I don't think it, it holds any weight. I think that's been a big thing for me because then it's, it, that's helped me let go of a lot of different ways that I view God less and less as a person and more and more as like, you know, kind of that, that, that idea of the ground of being sense of, of, you know, what, or who God is. And then, so I, that's probably the big thing. And I think that that's had the most ripple effects because then once that for me really kind of those metaphors deteriorated there's a lot more freedom mm -hmm. to uh, explore things and not, you know, this may sound weird, but uh, there's, there's, there's certain things that stick with you that you kind of have a hard time letting go of. I think number one, hell is one of them. Like every now and then I'll have this thought of, huh, what if they're, you know, maybe, I don't know. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then the other thing is this idea of, you know, it's not about a uh, religion, it's a relationship kind of idea. And uh, this what would Jesus do aspect and trying to be a type of person that emulates God or Christ or whatever. And uh, it's taken a lot of pressure off to be able to to let go of that and not feel as though like I'm having to emulate something else. Like it, 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 it affirms number one, that I, that I am a unique creation. I'm not just a duplicate. I'm not meant to just like perpetuate this one thing over and over again, that I have this ability to perpetuate myself. And I think that that's also helped in being a parent is to be like, oh yeah, you know, there isn't this formula or framework that you need to follow. And certainly it, you know, lends into my individualism and <laughs> lack of, you know, needing help from anyone or anything like that. But it also is, it's this, it's, it's more freeing than that. And actually, if I'm, if I'm honest, it helps me be open up more to help have help from people and to connect with people and to be more vulnerable with people because I see that. And it sounds weird for me or feels weird for me to say this, but that I'm like, if you, if everyone's perpetuating the same thing then I feel like it's easier to hide away because they're just going to get that somewhere else. But if I truly believe that I and my children are unique or people in general are unique, then lack of vulnerability is robbing people in my life of something different, of something unique. Yeah. So when I say that it feels like, you know, I'm robbing you because I'm so awesome, <laughs> which I don't like that aspect of it, but I mean, just the general idea. And then if I really believe that idea, I'm just trying to live into it in some way. Yeah. that That's a really cool take. And, and 
I, maybe I, I let um, you didn't ask for a suggestion, but rather rather than <laughs> using the 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 framework of robbery, um, because that would be taking something that somebody already had, is just you know there's there's a, a missed opportunity or you know there's an there's an offering that could be made, which yeah, coming from you, Jeff, would be completely unique. It, it's something that doesn't exist in the world without you putting it out there. This all sounds so processy. Um, <laughs> because if we're all in the process of becoming, right, we incorporate one another's offerings into our own becoming. So if you, mm-hmm. if you do hold on to what you have to offer in your unique sense, then, then what's possible in the world is much smaller. What's possible to each other is much smaller. So, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm Bonnie. I'm 100% on board the process theology. <laughs> My whole thing is I just think things and then someone else gives me the words for what I'm actually thinking <laughs> to humble me and say, hey, you're not the only one that's thought these things. There's words for them. Uh, Alan's been a big wordsmith in my life <laughs> to say, no, 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 that's this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think about like the, there's this big conversation right now about school in the fall, right? And right. Um, this debate between well, it's not a debate. That's not the right. A conversation that parents are having around what's go- going to happen uh, with our kids. They're needing to make adjustments to their life situations based on whether or not kids are going to be in class, in person classes or at home or, and it's huge. It's huge. And then teachers who, many of whom are also parents are are wondering what it's going to be like for them. Like, how do you, how do you conduct an in-person class and keep kids six feet away from each other and everybody's wearing masks and you know how do you balance all of that it's so complicated and i was just thinking about online education at least happening on zoom and as a teacher i was imagining myself in the position of a teacher and in order to teach and offer information you'd have to like mute everybody and you would be in control of that I mean, that just, there's something about that that just seems really like not productive to helping facilitate kids that are in the process of growing up. And when you mute somebody in their own space, then they, they're only interacting with their environment. They're not interacting with the environments of all the other spaces that are in, um, in on the screen. So I don't know. I mean, it's just thoughts that came to mind. I have no answers for it, but man, it's, it's a really interesting and, time that we live in and kids are going to go through transitions in their developmental stages while in a pandemic. Right. Well, I think it's important to remember, Bonnie, what you said earlier in this conversation is that, you know, in in other words, you know, kids are resilient. Like I think everyone's treating this time like, oh, if they have one semester or one year of school online, that the whole world's going to end for them and you've permanently ruined them psychologically. And I think that, uh, you know, it's, you know, scientifically, we're learning that the brain is a lot more pliable than we thought in the past so that there's a lot, you know, a lot more that can be done. And I think that we're looking at the wrong things. I think we're looking at in not, not to say this in a negative way, but we're looking we're inst- we're concentrating on the child itself as opposed to the systems that we've created around the child that are clearly flawed. You know, and we're not looking at, oh, wow, you know, first of all, this could happen all the time. Second of all, maybe we can't, we're, there's, I don't know, there's just this desire to return to normal. And I think that part of a time like this is to recognize, no, no, <laughs> our normal was wrong. It's time now to, to discover a new, you know, a new normal and, and really analyze, well, if this is good, if we're t- saying that these are the things that are important for our students to learn and thrive, if we're honest, were those things really even in place before? Maybe not, you know, or definitely not. <laughs> um, right. And I think that when we talk about a village and more and more people, like I, we have been fortunate, this the school situation, our kids' school during this time was almost overwhelmingly supportive and good at getting us information. And their, their teacher in particular, they broke them into small groups. They also had individual Zoom meetings and group, like they had all three of them so that they can kind of interact and times where they were going to be muted and times where they were not going to be muted. And, you know, there's a lot of 
creativity that can happen in the midst of times like this. All, all that to say, you know, kids are resilient. And absolutely. Yeah. And we could cancel school for a year. <laughs> I'm sure nobody wants to hear that, but, and they would be learning in new ways and different ways in whatever spaces that they were in, you know. And that's not to, not to discredit. I think we we do want to acknowledge that there are families that absolutely rely on school system for certain things like nutrition. And, you know, the, there's the economic value of, of a parent being able to work while their child's at school, that, that those are real things. Like, cause I feel like sometimes the conversation mm-hmm. about schooling and parenting gets centered around, you know, upper middle-class white people who have the freedom to, you know, be inconvenienced by having their kid at home instead of just sending them off where there's families that rely on the public school system for so much for their family. Yeah. I just yeah. think that's But there could be other ways of doing that. I, I oh, think. yeah. And Which is another that's... highlight of yeah. broken system. Exactly. Sure. Well, I think if we just, you know, didn't build any more weaponry for a while, we could probably fund every family to live. That's just crazy fine talk, Rajiv. <laughs> while, while their kids are at home. Yeah. I've heard of a movement, Defund Schools. You know, like defund the police, defund schools, which I know I, it's controversial and it's it's a radical idea. But what if, though, instead of thinking of, of, about it that way, perhaps thinking what other programs could we put in place as a society that really helps bring up children in the ways that they need to be brought up, that develops them in all sorts of ways, not just not just on this trajectory towards this like fake achievement, productivity rat race that. Um, they're sort of on right now. Yeah, the whole—I mean, the system as a whole, and not, not just schools, but the whole system is about creating um, parts of a machinery that fuels consumerism. You know, we're we're we've we've really lost sight of our humanity when it comes to the big picture. Um, we would just do things very very differently if if our human flourishing, our co flourishing, was at the center. Right. Yeah. I mean, in my experience, school was a game. I didn't, I didn't study or read, but I got good grades because I learned the system. Like I knew how to manipulate teachers. I knew how to like get different assignments and, you know, talking about the advent of technology, you know, it was weird when I was in high school it was right when you could like turn in that floppy disk, you know, that hard floppy disk for your paper. I would always turn in a blank one. It would give me like an extra week because by the time they graded, they'd be like, there's no file on here to be like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me get the, let me put the new file. Like it was just a game. It was, it was like this, this weird arbitrary, uh, you know, you didn't get this answer right on the test and school never considered the whole of who I was. Uh, I, I've been, I've been heartened and maybe I'm, this is an exception. Maybe we just have that, but just the things that our students, our kids are learning right now in school are so much better than when I was a kid. Like they're having, they have these like seven or eight habits that they learn just like being decent like that's just the simple like you know seek first to understand before being understood like little things like that none is never taught to me in school uh so i mean i hope that's reflection of some certain things or at least a movement in the right direction for the education system but yeah i mean this is maybe kind of getting all over the place but i think when we're talking about parenting it's an ascension of that you know the school to a certain extent that we choose is part of the parenting absolutely yeah. And, and, uh, you know, thanks to all the educators out there. I, <laughs> that was my field and I loved it so much. I love teaching, but often got very frustrated with systems, very frustrated because of the, the demands and the expectations teachers, you know, it's just, you're there to teach and to, uh, nurture the process of education. And often that was inhibited greatly by the systems. Yeah. And speaking as a former educator, there was nothing better than a supportive parent, you know, who really recognized that we were really partners in, in the care and development of the children that, that came through our doors. You know, during the school year, really kids spend more of their waking hours on campus oftentimes than they do at home. And that's, that's a sacred responsibility. And, you know, I, I certainly treated it as such, you know, and then there's also parents who, who could make life really difficult, but no, nothing better than supportive parents. 
you know, we're thinking about parenting during a pandemic. And it's interesting to think about the what's possible as we parent during a pandemic. For one thing, helicopter parenting isn't going to work. You can't, you won't be able to protect your kids from the consequences or the experiences that are resulting because of this pandemic. There's no like check you can write to like make everything in the world normal and good and, you know, fit their needs immediately. Instead, we're going to be doing what parenting really is, which is, you know, the world is sometimes tough and challenges arise and we're going to be in this together. We're going to get through it together and you're going to learn skills that you didn't have before to make it through really hard times. And I think that's kind of what parenting is, you know, all the way along. That's really what parenting is. And shout out to all the different kinds of parents out there. Yes. Yep. All the ways we can make family. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a much bigger thing than just biology. Right. hundred percent. Well, any, any closing thoughts other than on, on kind of this conversation before we, we get into our, our segment. Just lo- love your kids and let them know it. Yeah. Right. Give them lots of hugs. Right. And like, have fun. Like, have fun. celebrate them. Like, they're they're amazing. Like, if you if you can't find <laughs> something amazing about your kid, I don't know. <laughs> I I don't. Know. Right. You got you got to figure something out <laughs> because you know yeah. if you can't have those moments where you're just like in awe of mm-hmm. of where they're at where they're just like even just something as simple like if we're sitting down watching a movie and I'll just like look over and I'll like for two minutes just watch one of my daughters and their face and the reaction to it and just mm-hmm. have this moment of like oh my gosh yep. like yeah yeah it's uh it's fun it's hard hopefully it's it's worth it well it is worth it uh yeah i'm just mm-hmm. going to ramble at this point if i keep talking so yeah. uh <laughs> All right. Well, let us know what you think. You can add your voice to this particular conversation by going to the show notes at irenacast.com slash 173. There you'll also find all the relevant links and a complete list of all the other ways to like, follow, and contact the show. That's irenacast.com slash 173. And if you would like to continue this conversation with us live on Facebook and YouTube, you can do that this coming Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, where we will be doing our regular continuing the conversation. If you'd like to give your thoughts, but you can't make it live, then feel free always to email us at podcast at irenicast.com and give us your thoughts, questions, comments, concerns about this particular conversation, and we will read it on the live. Those lives are archived on our Facebook and YouTube page, so you can always go back and listen to them. For a time, we were offering the audio on the feed, but we are no longer doing that. So you do have to go to those platforms to get that conversation. So on the other side of the music, we are going to be playing a top three and we're going to be discussing our top three favorite TV families. So join us for that. All right, we are on the other side of the music, and we're going to be doing a segment that we've done several times, top three. Basically, we come up with the top three of a given category, and given the conversation that we just had, we're going to be doing top three favorite or most resonant TV families. Uh, So we'll we'll all count down for three, and then we'll go two, and then we will go one. So, uh, Rajiv, what is your number three favorite family? (laughs) Number three is Bob's Burgers. Okay. Okay. I, That's part, a good one. Partly because I think those parents, they like, you know, their kids are like weird and quirky and they just, they love them and, um, you know, they don't inhibit any of that stuff. And, and, and so they're just, they're just, I think a cool couple, but on, on the, the flip side, like I hate watching the show cause like I am Bob, Bob is me where he's just like, Oh my God, <laughs> half the time. <laughs> Like the, these these kids, these kids, and they have no respect for him. So <laughs> yeah, so I, I can relate. You identify as the persecuted father. Yes. <laughs> All right. The the Bob. I still have. Everyone says I got to check out that show, and I haven't got around to it yet. But it's on on my list. Oh, you're, you, you'll love it. it. Yeah, so much good, good animated stuff out there. All right, Bonnie. Number three. 
Okay, number three is um, it was actually a really formative show during my childhood, Little House on the Prairie. Oh, wow. Going old school. There we go. Yeah. I, you know, there's some, now that I'm a grown up and a little more socially justice minded, I see some glaring problems with it, but it, it also seems so sweet and endearing and taught me a lot about being a good person. So Little House on the Prairie. Nice. Along those lines for me, for my number three, uh, I, I want to say this out front. I acknowledge that any of my picks could be very problematic, including and probably most especially the one that I'm about to reveal. Uh, but we're talking about what th- things that resonate. And in the time, it resonated for me because it was a show that showed an imperfect family. It was one of the few times that I could watch a show and felt like, OK, I can kind of leave the family dynamics there because they're not making me long for anything. And that was for in terms of like media representation of my family situation, this was probably the closest that that resonated with me. And there are other things that resonated with me for really bad and wrong reasons. But the Bundys from Married with Children yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is my number three. Uh, and, I, you know, I I loved that show at the time and uh, reflecting on it, I probably can't watch it any longer. But I remember that feeling very comforted that a family could be that dysfunctional. It's like, okay, (laughs) I'm not the only one. (laughs) Not that it was a a direct reflection of my family, but that just the, the, just the general, this isn't traditional. It was nice to see that. So the Bundy's number three. It's a great show. Yeah. I I have fond memories of it. I, 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 at this point I've convinced myself that it was satire and maybe I, maybe it was, and I don't know. I haven't watched it in a really, really long time. Um, Anyway, number two, Rajiv, let's let's go around the bed. So my number two is Little House on the Prairie. Oh, really? yeah. I mean, there, there's a number of reasons. Is one, I, I just love the Lingle, Ingalls family, the parents especially. It, it it felt like there were actually parallels to their life and to our lives as an immigrant family trying to make our way. You know, they would go to these new lands, and you know, of course, you've got the whole stolen land thing with indigenous people. So that that's clearly a problem in retrospect, but growing up watching this show, partly learning what it was, what it meant to be American, it's just, I don't know, they, they like managed to stick together. They were a great team in a lot of ways. And you, you had this, you know, these strong parents who weren't, uh, you know, they were flawed. They, they made mistakes. They apologized. And I don't know. I just, I just love Little House on the Prairie. I still we watch the reruns. I can't remember which service it's on, and I, I love I love watching it even now. It was also on the wholesome approved watch list for <laughs> for those of us who were growing up in pretty conservative Christian homes. So that was another influence as well. And, and we part of probably why it was so special is we watched it together as a family, and so there was that that kind of time. To, together so that's that's up there my my first pick the bundies that was one that i had to sneak and watch so yeah. <laughs> it was not in our family's approved list either <laughs> yeah like the simpsons that was when we had oh, yeah, that was a, that, watch, what, a, what a weird cultural war that was the simpsons versus the cosby's <laughs> right. and how how did that turn out <laughs> oh man i could talk forever about that one it was so interesting uh anyway <laughs> Um, Bonnie, number two. Um, number two for me is Ugly Betty. Mm. I, you know, I didn't That's discover that till I was older um, and had kids of my own. But it was, I don't, I just really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that that series, and I it could identify with the main character trying to kind of move in between worlds and find her way in the world. Nice. I don't think I ever saw that one. It was one that I – do you know if it's streaming anywhere? It's some, I wanted to I see it for so. a while. I hope so. I haven't looked at I'm it in a while. I'm pretty sure. I'm sure it is. Everything but is. But I can't remember. It also had an experience of a, a girl growing up, and it wasn't always easy to – or it was sometimes mm-hmm. really hard to find those kinds of shows. Right. Uh, almost impossible. I can't even think of one off the top of my head from the 90s and before. Can you? Not in complicated character kinds of ways, huh. maybe right. 
not even main. Like there was Boy Meets World. There was the Wonder Years. Like yeah. all interesting. Yeah. We're going to do an episode on representation one of these days. And I'm going to go through media and television history. And it's going to be fun. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, all right. My number two is this is the idyllic for me. This is something that I was like, oh man, I wish I had that. And there's been many iterations of this family, um, but the the specific iteration from Smallville being the Kents, John and Martha, and uh, you know, good old Superman. Uh, but just just the idea of like, how do you deal with a child that could tear you in <laughs> in half in one second, and then watch all the stuff that. That Superman goes through and always just have this grounded approach. And I mean, I think it's an important part of the, the character of Superman in general, but just the small iteration of it too. There was something very familiar about it. Um, and, you know, problematic in certain ways, but you know, I guess at this point, <laughs> what show isn't, uh, but I just, I, I really, as I was watching and I was watching that one as a, as a, I think it's, it premiered when I was like second year into being a youth pastor uh, and it was a time in my life where there was a lot of, I've had phases of kind of just an anal- analyzing my family history. And it was just nice to have like, oh yeah, the Kent farm. I want to go there. <laughs> That's a good one. Mm-hmm. That I have to good one. look at that again. And Smallville. I was, it's, I, I watched the first season, I think. I think the first two seasons are in terms of like, the you know because the superhero story has been done so many different ways, but in terms of like the formation of a superhero and how influential, I mean specifically in in that show, father, but just family dynamics is to where someone ends up, and the the friendship that Clark and uh, Lex had in the first two seasons was to me some there's some really good television there, uh, but it, you know it got more comic booky as it went on, which I'm not opposed to, but. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why some people would be. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. All right. Our, our number one, Rajiv. Number one. Now, I've got two honorable mentions. We'll do, do honorable mentions after the <laughs> okay. number one. Yeah. All right. So my number one all-time favorite, and I would say this is by far and away my favorite as a family, is Good Times with Florida and James Evans. You know, this is a, a black family in an apartment building. Um, when I watched it, we lived... Uh, and I remember watching it, living in an apartment building, um, and just parents trying to make it work and trying to protect their kids from what was out there and keep them from getting sucked into stuff, which my family absolutely did. So I just I love that show, and they dealt with some real stuff. You know, they were they were very courageous. So it was just a, just a beautiful show, and even the artwork on the intro, I still. I, like I can still see that vividly. So anyway, I hope it's still streaming on Hulu somewhere or somewhere. We'll, we'll have to find it. Every show that we mention here will be in the show notes. And if, for those of you that are curious, there's a, a website called just watch type in your favorite show. It'll tell you exactly where you can either purchase it or where it's going to be streaming. And every show that we link in our show notes takes you to that website to show you where you can watch it. So if everyone's curious why they're listening. All right, Bonnie, number one. Okay, number one. And, you know, TV and and this isn't my, like, number one medium for taking in stuff. So I have to, like, think harder than, <laughs> than other people do. Um, but I would say my number one show in this category is the One Day at a Time um, remake. I really, really loved that show. It it was really complicated. It centered women's experience. I think also had a great, a great illustration of how immigrant families integrate or I don't know what the world it, word is for it, but like how people do community together across difference. And that seemed really relevant to my particular family dynamic. I would say check it out. I don't know how popular it was it's, in its day, it's so good. but it's really good. You mean the reboot? The re- the yeah, the re yeah. yeah, the reboot. The original was good too. I don't know the original as well. Yeah, the I haven't seen the remake of this one. I've heard all good things. I know that it was canceled by Netflix, but then picked up by another network. But I, overall, I think Netflix is doing great job in terms of yeah. like bringing back the sitcom. I mean, there's hit and misses there, but they're they're do, when they hit it, they're they're doing mm-hmm. a good job, and it's been nice because sometimes you just want a sitcom like. 
we don't need the heavy cinematic TV show all the time, although I love it. Sometimes mm-hmm. I just want a, a silly sitcom. And exactly. when you can add some like real heart to it and a different story that's not yours, it's it's just nice. You know, it's like it's like a how about mm-hmm. you, Jeff? The mind number one is outside of the traditional family model, and it's more of like a friend group that find each other out of their own brokenness. And it is probably also one of my favorite shows of all times, but I'm going with the study group from community. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh. It is yeah. the, the, and it, it was the first thing that came to mind. I knew it was going to be my number one because the, it's all the family dynamics of like a meshment and like all that kind of stuff in this thing that uh, Dan Harmon writes and creates with these characters. And I just, I think it's, it's more it's probably the most relevant to my experience where my family groups in eras of my life have been more my family uh that I felt connected to and uh community is just a wonderful example of that and even just like even though the later seasons aren't as good as the earlier seasons but just the way that it evolved too like people can come in and out of a family and it doesn't always have to be the static same people and yeah so community study group my number 1 family of all time on television for sure very cool i love that show oh it's so good that is a great one i just recently rewatched it again and it yeah totally, i think I sh- i'm gonna start rewatching. totally well it mostly holds up <laughs> i know that they've taken one episode out due to recent events which is understandable but yeah it's, so if they could just like delete chevy chase right i do not <laughs> like <laughs> he's awful he really is he's I mean, not even just in the show, but just <laughs> as a person. I just have never been a fan of Chevy Chase. I just can't stand him. Anyway, honorable mentions. Rajiv, do you have any? Yeah, I got two. I got two. So my my first honorable mention is Blackish. Yeah, that's a pretty popular show. And what I love about that is, you know, he's got, you know, a pretty reasonable level of success in the professional world. But he, he comes home. And his kids, you know, roll their eyes at him and he he and his wife have a great relationship. But like in every every opportunity, and this is part of where I really relate, it's like she's the she's always smarter than him. And she she like looks at him in this way, like really, but at the same time it's like the super endearing way. I'm like, I know that look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I just I love the show. The characters, the writing, and they they do they take on some some really important topics in ways that no other show on network television can at this time. My other one is a Netflix show, which I love it's gentified and it's the grandpa's the head of the household. Grandma's passed away, but they, there's a family restaurant and he's got three grandchildren, two grandsons and a granddaughter and their different experiences in the Latinx community and, rent and gentrification and queerness and immigration. Um, just, I love the show. It's, uh, you know, I don't know when they're going to get to pump out their next season, but I'm hooked. I, I look forward to it coming out. I have a couple honorable mentions too. Um, one is all in the family mm-hmm. <laughs> from back in the day. Mm-hmm. I think what I love about it is it's sort of the antithesis of cancel culture. It's, you know, like, how do you, with very different viewpoints, how do you still somehow stay in family together and, and work through stuff? And I think it's a great show for that. Um, and then another one that I don't think has gotten much play, I think it only made it through one season is Transparent. I just, um, the, the creators of that show, I think are very creative and I would love to see more shows like that. Yeah, that show in particular, I haven't got around to see, but I'm I'm pretty confident they're not going to have any more seasons because of the uh, yeah. allegations against the main actor in that particular show. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I I still want to get around to seeing that one for sure. Uh, honorable mentions one that was very close to making my list. Uh, was a show that ran for three seasons back in 2017, just after the election of Donald Trump. It was called the Carmichael Show, and it was with a uh, comedian. I think. Jared Carmichael and it's uh, and he had uh, David Allen Greer as the father and then uh, the mother and the the son 
and his so it's just like it's it's it was modeled literally after the Cosby show like it even has like this was filmed in front of his studio and it's like it really tried to model that whole like whatever and even one of the episodes in where basically every episode it's in the same location and every episode is essentially just a conversation with the family uh one was about Donald Trump because the parents voted for Donald Trump even though they were uh, a black couple and the kids are like how could you vote for Donald Trump so it had all those things they even had a show about the problematic nature of Bill Cosby and the allegations against him at the time. Wow. So it's just really like they went through these really complicated issues in a sitcom format. Um, and it was, is really, really good. All three seasons are on Hulu right now. And it's just, cool. uh, it's definitely okay. worth watching. Yeah. Uh, check that out. But I definitely. think they just ended it. They are just like, well, we, we kind of had our three season run mm-hmm. and, and we, they didn't want to do any more. I, which I'm sad about, but definitely really cool family dynamic. So it was very close to making my list. Uh, and then uh, the other two that just went, as soon as we said TV families, the two that popped up from my head when I was a child were Fresh Prince of Bel Air and Family Ties. They just, I don't know. Oh, sure. When I think of families, yeah. I see yeah, those yeah. pictures. So th- those are my uh, honorable mentions. <laughs> all right. Well, all this talk about parenting and family. Yes. Uh, I got to get back to it. So <laughs> uh, that'll do it for us this week. If you enjoy Irenicast and you would like to join the work that we are doing, please consider donating to our PayPal link at irenicast.com slash PayPal. We're all committed to keeping the show for free for listeners, but there are costs involved and your financial support helps. That's irenicast.com slash PayPal. Irenicast is also a nonprofit organization, so your donations are tax deductible. You can also support the show by simply making sure you've subscribed to the show on whatever app you listen. And if the platform allows it, leave a rating and or review. So for this week, I'm Jeff. I'm Bonnie. This is Rajiv. Thanks for joining the conversation.